So yeah, I'll be talking about reinforcement learning. And uh, let's start with the obvious question. Um, what is reinforcement learning? So before I, I dive in, let me just start by saying that um, from what I heard about the, uh, the intent of this talk here is that we, um, that we make sure that we bring people aboard also who aren't very familiar with uh, the topics that are being discussed. Um, that means that I'll start with some of the core concepts of reinforcement learning in a moment and I'll, I'll go through everything a little bit um, basically from the ground up. But that said, of course, we don't have a lot of time. We just have one afternoon. So I will be going uh, fairly quick at some point through some of the uh, material. Um, so I just wanted to tell you to stop me whenever you feel confused about anything because if you do, you're probably not the only one. And then you could, be, you could help each other out quite a bit by just asking a question at that point. Um, and then later on, in the, uh, maybe in the second, maybe we'll split down the middle and in the second uh, half, uh, I'll talk about some more um, cutting edge research, current research in uh, reinforcement learning and in what's sometimes these days called deep reinforcement learning. Um, if you already know reinforcement learning, maybe the beginning will be uh, quite known to you already, but still it's useful to uh, know uh, uh, what my notation is, how I think about things perhaps. And again, stop me if you think anything is unclear or if you disagree with anything. Okay, so let's dive in now. But first we'll pop up to the motivation, to the high, high level. Um, so this is very high level, so this is one way to think about how does this fit into a larger context of uh, artificial intelligence research. Um, and we could start by saying, well, first we started automating repeated physical solutions in the Industrial Revolution at some point. Basically, we started building machines to take over tasks that we were, had been doing by hand. Of course, this is actually older than the Industrial Revolution. It's something that goes back throughout history. Um, that we find mechanisms and tools to ma basically make tasks easier for us. Now, more recently, there was a, basically a second revolution, you could say, um, where we uh, were able, using computers, to automate repeated mental solutions. For instance, think of a calculator. We know how to do addition, we know how to do multiplication, and we know it precisely enough to be able to basically tell a machine how to do those operations, and then the machine can help us do them maybe more precise and maybe a lot faster than we can do. And now I'd argue that we're basically at the start or in the middle of uh, maybe something that could be yet another revolution where we now no longer think of the solutions ourselves beforehand, but instead we build machines that can themselves find solutions. And this is the whole purpose of artificial intelligence in a sense, that we want systems that we then could call artificially intelligent now, many people have many definitions for what intelligence then means, but to me, this means that they can find their own solutions to a well-posed problem. So this requires that they could learn autonomously how to make decisions, and I'll get back to that, specifically that word, decisions. But first, what does it mean generally to find solutions um, for problems? Um, early approaches to artificial intelligence in involved encoding rules and knowledge by hand, and then having the machine maybe reason through these. Uh, again, basically, a calculator is actually a good example of this, where the rules are very well defined and uh, uh, there's some knowledge involved maybe in, in defining these rules in the first place. Um, and you type in maybe the knowledge that you want to add, say, 2 plus 3, you type that in and then the machine can use its rules to deduce an answer to that question. Typically, the rules were very, fairly general, like modus ponens. Basically, if A, then B, you could model that precisely and then you could put in the knowledge which A's are true and you could deduce which Bs would then uh, follow from that. Of course, this is a very trivial rule. You could build up quite complex systems by chaining these types of rules together. However, encoding knowledge by hand has some caveats, some pitfalls. For instance, slight errors in the encoding can lead to unforeseen consequences. Because you're not in control of the com complete reasoning, you're in control of setting up the reasoning, but you're not in the loop at each point of the reasoning typically. This means that if you have a slight error in your encoding of the knowledge, there could be conclusions that drop out of it that are basically false, but if you don't follow all of the steps of the reasoning, you would find it very hard to be able to tell that. Um, this is related to the other two points up there, which is that you, you basically can 
error in two different ways when you set up a system like this. One is that you go for too low a level of detail, and then often the results are quite brittle and likely wrong in the sense that they are too general to, uh, to be useful. Um, it might be easy to reason through these systems though, and this is why the other caveat isn't important. If you have a very high level of detail, even if all your encoded knowledge is correct, it might be very hard to compute the conclusions. It might just be very hard to go through all the required reasoning steps to come up with conclusions. Now what is an alternative? Um, machine learning in general, in my definition, refers to uh, the research field which does research after algorithms that do not define these rules and knowledge uh, at the same level, but instead define learning updates that then can be used to extract rules and knowledge from data. And this is the important bit. So basically the difference between these two approaches, of course I'm talking about them quite prototypically as if they're completely separate for simplicity, which they don't need to be. But the difference, the main difference between these two approaches is one is where you set up a system and you put all the knowledge in basically beforehand and the other is a system where you basically um, set up the system in such a way that it can consume new information, new data during its uh, lifetime, if you want to call it that, and can then build up new knowledge from the data. Now obviously there's a large overlap with classical statistics here where also conclusions come from the data and indeed um, these two fields, statistics and machine learning, are very tightly related. Um, and in classical statistics we also analyze the data algorithmically with some well-defined statistic methods and then we can base uh, our decisions that we make on the outcome of this analysis. However, typically we still choose which analysis to apply beforehand ourselves and we decide what we do with the outcome of these analyses. So it's not fully um, self-contained, it's not fully autonomous in a sense. So essentially we want to go further and we want to uh, ask the question whether we can learn to make decisions automatically from data as well. And that is basically what reinforcement learning is. Um, as it says on the slide, we and other intelligent beings, I posit, learn by interacting with our environment and then consuming these interactions. And this differs from other, certain other types of learning. For instance, it's active. You might actively seek out new information that can help you learn. But you also have to take into account that interactions are sequential and that future interactions can depend on earlier ones. If you go down a certain path, you might not see certain things that would have maybe uh, been useful to know about. So there's this tight coupling now between the learning process, the analysis if you want to call it that in more statistic uh, uh, terminology, and um, the decisions that the system makes. Typically we're also goal directed, I'll get back to that, why this is important. And we can learn without examples of optimal behavior. So this one's maybe a little bit controversial, let me say something very briefly about that, which is that um, in some sense one view of reinforcement learning is that you are a system that has certain input-output mapping and the inputs are just some raw sensory uh, stimuli that you get. You get your vision, you get your uh, hearing, at least like we do. Um, you could set up a system, or artificial system, with a whole bunch of other sensors, of course. And then even if there is a similar system out there that ha already has a good behavior, um, you would have to either encode that knowledge or the system would basically have to learn, just by looking at the other system, uh, what to do. So this is not necessarily just mimicking, or it's, it's not trivial to mimic. And typically, um, we would not necessarily learn only from mimicking other, uh, other smart entities. We also have to be able to learn in a different way. So the general interaction loop of reinforcement learning is then this one, where there is an agent and we will talk about basically the internals of that agent. How does that agent learn uh, in the world? And there is an environment and the, the interaction is quite simple that you could see um, the agent executing an action as sending that to the environment and this action might have a certain consequence and then the environment in a sense sends back an observation or phrased differently the agent pulls in a new observation. And then this new observation could lead to a different next action and so on. So this continues over time and can, can cycle indefinitely. And I'll get back to the diagram again also later. But first I wanted to touch upon diff two different uh, distinct reasons you might want to learn. And 
um, this is good to be able to also to put other research into context because often people are not very explicit about this distinction um, or not always very explicit about which, ones they're, which one they're interested in. Uh, but it's good to realize that they are different. And the first distinct reason to learn would be to solve something. This is, uh, the idea is here to extract new, better solutions. And when I say solve, I mean this in a somewhat soft sense. I don't necessarily mean finding the only or optimal solution to a certain problem. I also mean finding good solutions if there's a certain ranking among the solutions, at least better ones than you initially start with. So an example of this would be to find a program that can play uh, the board game of Go better than any human. This would be, uh, the goal here is to find a certain solution. The other goal, which might be uh, of interest, is to be able to adapt. And here it's important that you can find good solutions online during the interaction. So an example here would be a robot that navigates terrains that differ from any, any expected terrain or any terrain that it was previously, previously trained on. The main distinction here is whether, you're, um, whether it's enough to learn offline, maybe from some simulator or some pre-recorded data or something. In the first case, when you just want to find a solution, this might be sufficient. But if you want to learn online, you need algorithms that can uh, work well within that regime, that can learn, for instance, fast. If something happens that is important and it is novel, you might want to be able to adapt quickly, because otherwise you might take the wrong decision, and if it's, if it's uh, an irreducible path, you might take a wrong decision that you can never recover from, and then learning might cease, because say your robot is now stuck in a certain room that it can never exit again with its current uh, uh, wheels or whatever you gave the robot. Um, Reinforcement learning as a general field of research seeks to find solutions for both of these cases. And um, I also wanted to note that the second point is not just about being able to generalize. It's not just for being able to learn from your initial data set and then being able to generalize to many different cases. It's also about efficient learning online, as I said, during the operation. Okay, so back to the question what reinforcement learning is. So, I like to define reinforcement learning as the science of learning how to make decisions from interaction. And it's maybe also good to keep in mind that um, I think of reinforcement learning more as the framework than as a specific set of algorithms. This sometimes gets conflated, um, also in the, in the academic uh, literature on the topic. Um, there's, a, there's such a thing as reinforcement learning algorithms, but reinforcement learning as a whole could be viewed as both the algorithms and the framework around this. And the framework is very general. Um, in, in order to reason about making decisions and interacting with the world, we need to reason about time, about consequences of actions, about actively gathering experience, about predicting the future, and about dealing with uncertainty. Now this is tricky because it's a very general problem, but it also has huge potential scope. So I'm just positing here as a slightly provocative uh, question to think about. Is this enough as a framework to basically capture the goal of artificial intelligence? This is not saying that we're there yet. It's not saying, oh, the current reinforcement learning algorithms solve artificial intelligence. It's merely asking the question, is the framework sufficient? I'm not going to give an answer to that. This is up to you to decide whether you agree with that or not. Um, so how does reinforcement learning differ, differ from other machine learning paradigms? For one, Normal machine learning has two big strands of uh, research, one could say. One is unsupervised learning, but the more popular larger strand is supervised learning, which assumes that you have certain uh, labels that your system can consume. You basically have a mapping from certain inputs to outputs, and the system can see many examples of this and then learn to mimic that mapping, maybe generalizing appropriately to new inputs. In reinforcement learning, we do not assume that a mapping exists that gives you uh, the exact optimal behavior. Instead, we're going to give you something else. We're going to give a reward signal that tells the agent on each step, how much did I like that, basically, that action that you just did. This is not quite the same as having a supervision signal, because for one, we're not telling you that this was the best thing you could do. You might not know what uh, your rewards might essentially be unbounded, and you see, say, a plus 10, but you don't know whether you could have gotten a plus 20 in the same uh, situation. But also because we're talking about sequential interactions with the environments, the feedback can be delayed and not instantaneous, which means that a reward that you see right now 
might actually depend on an action that you did much earlier. Because this action that you did much earlier got you to a situation in which you could now do something that gives you the reward. This means that time matters. There's a sequence to these interactions. And this is also different from uh, many earlier machine learning algorithms where often we assume that we can sample from some data set, for instance, independently. Or if we have an actual data set, we, we may, might just scramble these in terms of ordering because the ordering doesn't actually matter. And in fact, it might work better if you scramble them. But here, this is not the case. Earlier decisions do affect later interactions, typically, which means you can't just throw away the time in order to reason about these. And essentially, these two last points means that we have to respect causality, that an action can only in affect things that happen later and not things that happened before. So what are examples of decision problems? So here's a couple. So Fly, flying a helicopter is an example, managing an investment portfolio, controlling a power station, making a robot walk, or playing video or board games. And this is a somewhat maybe arbitrary list of uh, uh, examples, but these are all examples that reinforcement learning has been applied to. This is why they're up there. There's many more, but this is a nice diverse uh, set I found. And as I said, if you think about reinforcement learning as a framework rather than a single solution method, um, these are all reinforcement learning problems, no matter which solution you use to find <coughs> solutions to this decision problem, in a sense. And indeed, in some of these cases, uh, more popular approaches won't typically be called reinforcement learning algorithms because maybe they, uh, they fall under some other uh, terminology heading. So here's a video, just to make that a little bit more concrete. This is an agent that has learned to play a bunch of Atari games. Uh, this, these are video games from the 80s. And they're fairly simple compared to current day uh, video games, but they're still complex enough that the dynamics are not immediately obvious. So in this case, there's a submarine that you're controlling and apparently you have to shoot the fish. But after every once so often, um, your oxygen almost runs out, which you can see at the bottom, and then you have to go up for new air. And there's also divers that it uh, has to collect, I believe. Um, so there's long-term dependencies, there's short-term dependencies, there's reactive uh, parts to this decision process, and there's non-reactive parts. This is a more reactive game in which the goal is to uh, uh, race against other cars. Those are meant to be cars. And here the... Uh, you can see that the situations change. I believe that the course here is probably more slippery when it's white because it's uh, icy, which means that maybe the interaction changes a little bit. This is another example. Most of these games are actually fairly reactive in the sense that if you have a good reactive policy, then you, you, you could do quite well. But this doesn't hold for all of them. Some actually require you to reason through multiple time steps in order to do the right thing. But as you see, the agent has learned to do fairly well. And it also learns, for instance, to hide behind objects. This is the classic Space Invaders game. And I, I can note that you can't actually see it on the screen right now, but here you can now at the top see the score. And in this case, um, the reward signal for the agent, again at the top here we have the score. This is a boxing game. Um, and then it does fairly well. And in the, the, all these situations, the reward signal was basically defined as the difference in score from one step to the other. This is the classic breakout game where the goal is to uh, get rid of all these blocks by moving the paddle around and hitting the ball, the little pixel is a ball, against the blocks. And this agent does that fairly well and actually learns to tunnel so they can get lots of score really quickly. So that was a, an example of somewhat lo longer term uh, decision policy there where at some point it starts hitting the blocks on the side with, you could say, the intent, if you want to call it that, of getting the ball behind the other blocks so it can get many points fairly quickly. The reason it wants the points fairly quickly is essentially that we've defined the objective, and I'll say that more precisely later. We define the objective in such a way that the agent actually prefers uh, 
fast rewards a little bit over later rewards, even if the rewards themselves are the same. Otherwise, it wouldn't care, and it would just maybe very slowly chip away at everything, and it uh, might not care about when the rewards come in. Okay. So, the core high-level concepts of a reinforcement learning system are essentially that we have an environment and an agent, and the agent might contain, uh, and I'll get, get back to all of these, an agent state, which is basically the internal state of the agent at any moment in time, a policy, which defines the behavior of the agent, um, probably a value function, although this is not strictly necessary. I mean, the minimal, minimal thing you would ha want to have in an agent is a policy, and then you could already call it an agent. Might not be a very smart one, but actually there are good policy learning methods as well, so it could be a fairly smart one. Um, I'll talk a bit more about what, what value functions are, and optionally you could also build a model, or have a model, I personally am mostly interested in algorithms that learn from samples, which means that I won't assume that a true model is given. This is also an active area of research, which is typically called planning or search. When you, given a certain model, you want to find a solution as quickly as possible, or as uh, well performant as possible. Maybe not optimal if that's too hard, if the search problem is too large. Um, I personally am more interested in learning methods, so when you, when you want to apply something like search or planning, you would then have to build a model, which means that you're no, uh, the agent might internally have a model, but it might be one that it has learned from data. And then, as I mentioned, there's a reward signal. Actually, these rewards could be internal to the agent. You could have different agents that have different reward signals. Or, and this is basic, basically more typically what is done these days, it could be our specification of what we want the agent to achieve. So, for instance, in these Atari games, the rewards could be considered more or less external to the agent because we, as the designer of the agent, we tell the agent, whenever your score changes, that's your reward. This is what you're supposed to optimize. But this is why I didn't put the reward in the signal, oh, sorry, in the figure. There's a variant of this figure that uh, is often used where the environment, in, in addition to an observation, also emits uh, a reward signal. And... I basically wanted to not commit to that because the reward could be inside of the agent. Um, alternatively, you could also just view the reward as being part of the observation if you still wanted to, be, to come from the environment. So that means that at each time step, which we'll typically denote with uh, T, the agent observes big O T, big O because it's a random variable, and a, and a reward, and then it executes an action, and then the environment receives that action and emit, emits a new observation. Or as I said, you could also view that as a pull action by the agent that pulls in a new observation. Now I'm essentially introducing a little bit of notation on the previous slide and on this one. And the policy that I talked about that defines the behavior of the agents is typically denoted by pi and it could be deterministic, in which it's just a function that uh, consumes a state. I'll talk about state in a moment, but you can think of it as the observation for now, for concreteness. <coughs> and then outputs an action. It could also be stochastic, and in some cases this is quite useful to have stochastic policies, both for learning and because sometimes actually the optimal policy is one that is stochastic. And in that case, we might write that the action is sampled from, the, from the, the policy at that state. So examples of policies could be when the temperature drops below 15 degrees, you turn on the heat. So the, the fact that the temperature, the temperature itself might be the state, and then turning on the heat might be the action. As a different example, say you have a robot, it might have a policy that says, when there is a wall in front of me, I turn right. Where again, the observation that there's a wall in front is then the state, and then turning right is the action. The reward is just a scalar feedback signal. Um, some people write this as a function of the state. Um, I prefer just to subscript it with a time t because then it doesn't have to be a function of the state. Um, this is convenient because in a moment I'll talk about the state internal to the agent and the state of the environment, which might be different. And if the reward comes from the environment, you might not be able to construct the reward from your internal state of the agent. But you could just think of it as a scalar signal that at each time step arrives. And this is indicating how well the agent is doing. And it defines the goal. 
And the actual goal of the agent is not to maximize its immediate reward, but instead to maximize its cumulative reward over time. We denote this with a capital G, which um, if you want to, for, to make it easier to remember, you can think of this as the goal, therefore G. But we call this the return for historical reasons. So there's two, these two concepts. The reward is the immediate reward on each time step, and the return is the cumulative reward over time into the future. Both of these are random. And now reinforcement learning is based on something called the reward hypothesis, which states that any goal can be formalized as the outcome of maximizing a cumulative reward. And so I put a question below whether you agree with that. And it's, it's good to think about this a little bit. And I found it hard to come up with counterexamples myself. So if you have budget constraints, this could just be part of the state. And therefore the reward from any state might, the return from any state might still be well defined in the sense under those budget constraints. Um, you could also, depending on how you want to set it up, there's a different, different solution. Uh, let's say you want to maximize, uh, let's say rewards are money. Let's, you, you mentioned uh, investing as a potential thing. But you want to not go bankrupt. So maybe there's a constraint in a sense. Can this still be phrased as a reward signal? And I'm going to say yes, but maybe then you shouldn't pick the rewards to just be money but you should also give a large negative reward for whenever you go bankrupt. At which point you can reason about the combination of those things. So it might not always be trivial to pick a reward function that encodes exactly what you want to achieve because of these uh, constraints that you might want to, ha want to have to encode. But that's not what the hypothesis says. It doesn't say it's easy. It just says there, there exists a reward that matches any goal that you might want to give it. Yes? So if the goal is impossible, could you then uh, still encode this properly in a sense? It might be meaningless. And indeed, um, it is quite possible to give a reward signal that you cannot actually meaningfully optimize, at which point the agent would just maybe learn to do random things because it doesn't really matter what it does. However, what we'll typically do in reinforcement learning is we'll define an optimal policy, which is with respect to what the agent can do. And so if something is unachievable, it's basically irrelevant. It's not within the space of the problem that you're setting out to solve. But again, it might be that when you specify the reward and you don't think it through, you might think that a certain thing is possible and then turns out the agent never learns it, but it was actually because it was impossible. That could happen. So these are, these are great questions. Thanks. Yeah. How about a goal that changes with your rewards? A goal that changes with your rewards. So it's actually dependent on the reward that you've already accrued. This could very well um, be, but again, you could then define a new reward function that takes it into account. Or alternatively, you could think of the, the rewards that you've already accrued as being part of the state now, from which, um, let, me, let me be more concrete, actually. So that what, what, what humans often, um, in modeling humans, in terms of how we, for instance, interact with money, there's this um, notion of, uh, almost a logarithmic curve from empirical data that we, when we have more money, we care less about more increments in some sense, which means we don't actually reason linearly about money, we reason maybe logarithmically about money. But then this could also be covered with this formulation, but then maybe what you want to uh, optimize is not um, the raw money again, but some transformation thereof. But with the suitable transformation, you should be able to still capture this interaction of the money you've already accrued with the money you're still going to accrue. Um, so again, the point is not that any reward uh, definition will give you the right solution. It's more that there must exist a reward function that gives you the, the solution that you're intending to, uh, to achieve. And it might be a non-trivial one. So maybe, maybe in that sense, this hypothesis is not always that useful. Yes? Yes? 
Yes, so it's a good question about um, when time goes to infinite, when your future goes to infinity. And you touched about something there which is quite interesting. So um, what I'll actually say on the next slide is that we often trade off near time rewards with long term rewards by using a discount factor. Actually, just, let me just skip to that slide. With a discount factor, gamma, which is between 0 and 1, and it basically just weighs down each of the rewards a little bit as they go further, further out. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that it's actually sometimes convenient to define your goals. Um, another is that even if your true goal is the undiscounted return into the future, um, the algorithms might find it much easier to reason about something that is a little bit more myopic. This is more of a practical concern. Um, but in many problems, we actually do care about the trade-off like this. Like I said in, the, in that Atari game that we just saw, the agent actually cares about getting scores quickly rather than late because of a discount factor. The agent that learned that had a discount factor. Now, there is an alternative formulation that I'm not going to talk about further today, which is the average reward formulation, where you basically talk about the average reward that you can accrue on each step. And if you talk about the average reward, you don't necessarily need this discount anymore. Because if the rewards are all positive, and you wouldn't have this discount, then the value could just be infinite. But it could be infinite for many policies, which means that it's very hard to distinguish between one policy having a, a larger infinite value than a different one. Of course, then you could try to find mechanisms around that, and th th this might well be possible. But in those cases, if you're actually interested in the undiscounted future, it might actually be easier to reason about the average reward than, than about the future uh, discounted cumulative reward. Fortunately, Many of the algorithms still apply, many of the theory still applies for both these cases. So this might be something that we can interject later. And because of the uh, uh, more common use, just the discounted future returns, uh, I'm going to focus on that for today. Okay. So I've already covered most of this slide, let me just give a couple of examples. So if your discount factor is zero, this means we only actually care about immediate rewards. This is actually quite a common setup. Um, if there are also no states, if there's only one, one single state, alternatively, and we have a bunch of different actions, and we only care about the immediate reward, this is called a multi-armed bandit problem. And this is an in a problem of interest because there's lots of applications even for this much simpler reinforcement learning problem with only a single state and no future, no time dependencies in some sense. And for instance, this is used uh, often, there's many papers about this, in, uh, in advertising, where you could think of uh, any sort of certain website, you have a certain ad you want to show, you want to optimize the number of clicks, say. Your click, number of clicks could be your reward. And then you just show an ad, you see if that works, uh, you show a different one. The main problem then becomes one of expiration, where you want to try new things occasionally. You want to try from maybe the many possible actions that you have, um, but you don't want to try actions that don't give you a lot of return too often. This is called the expiration exploitation trade-off. And you can already interestingly reason about that even if the reward is immediate. But it becomes even of, uh, maybe a bigger concern when you ha have a sequential problem, of course. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, last point of this slide, so the discounts can vary over time. Most of the classic papers have a fixed discount, which is given as part of the problem formulation. But actually it turns out to be quite useful to have the flexibility to allow the discounts to change over time. They could, for instance, be a function of the state, or they could just vary over time because of non-stationarity in your problem, or they could be a random function of something else that is not in your state, maybe. And this turns out to be useful to have the additional flexibility. But you don't need to worry too much about that here. We, you can just mostly think of them as being just some number between 0 and 1, the trades of the near term versus the long term. Yeah? Uh, does the agent, can the agent predict uh, how much reward we will get from performing an action? Or does, yeah. does he get the reward once he performs the action and then cannot change his mind? Yeah, so can the agent, how can the agent reason about the reward it gets when it has taken an action? And indeed, in general, we assume that if you take an action, you will consume that reward, and you won't be able to take back that action. Now, in the multi-armed bandit setting, because you're basically in the same state over and over again, you can try a different one next time in the same state. Um, 
in full reinforcement learning setting, taking the action will have changed your states, which means you can't actually undo that action again unless you're in a specific problem in which you could do that. So indeed, then the point becomes to already learn to predict the consequences of your actions before taking them so that you can take well-informed actions before seeing the results. This is slightly different in planning. If you have access to the model, of course, you could just look at all the actions, the hypothetical outcomes from that, and then the only problem becomes computational. Do you actually want to look at everything? Might be too much. It's a great question. And speaking of which, about predictions, so this is something that we often want to predict. It's not the immediate reward, but it's actually the value, which is the uh, future potentially discounted return. And there's an expectation here, so it's the expected return. And this expectation is basically about everything that is random, including potentially your policy, if your policy is random. But the uh, problem itself might also be random. So if you take a certain action in a certain situation, the reward you get in the next state you end up in might not always be the same, even if your state that you started in was the same. Um, we use shorthand that we just subscript the expectation with pi if all the actions are ta uh, taken according to policy pi, typically your current policy. And this then allows you to reason about what the value is of your current policy in a certain state. And now the goal for the agent basically becomes to maximize value. So we're not, in not interested in maximizing the actual return because often you can't if it's stochastic. But you can try to maximize the expected return. And then the rewards and values basically define the desirability of a state or an action. There's no supervised feedback, which, which means basically that you might not be able to know the true value from any state in action. You might not be able to even know the maximal attainable value from a certain state in action. But you can still learn these things from interaction. And note that the return, as uh, down on the, on the slide in the equation, and also the value can be defined recursively. And this is going to be useful for algorithms later on. So why, why are values so important in reinforcement learning? Because they're a very central uh, concept in reinforcement learning. Um, so roughly speaking, if we can predict everything, arguably we know all that there is to know. And in order for that to be true, maybe we have to be quite lenient with what we, uh, what we call prediction. But you could think of doing an experiment and being able to predict the outcome. If you can predict the outcome exactly, then you knew all that there was to know about that experiment in a sense. Um, but also if you can predict, in a sense, the outcome of some uh, maybe logical deduction or something, then again you knew everything that there was to know about this. So in that sense, values can be used to encode knowledge about the world, perhaps. Might be good to note here that there's different types of knowledge. There's self-contained mathematical knowledge, and separately there's empirical knowledge, which is basically what we're talking about here, which is the knowledge about what the outcomes are of uh, processes in the real world, perhaps. We can construct values, so in order to make use of this, we can construct values over more than just the reward signal, which is this one scalar signal. Um, essentially, we can define values over all of the signals that the the agent has access to. For instance, you could think of the raw sensory readings. You could either try to predict those and discount at future sums of those, or functions of those, and then construct functions of those, and then try to predict those. For instance, you could try to predict uh, for a robot when it hits a wall. Let's say it has a, a bumper sensor, and then when it actually hits a wall, it can tell that the sensor goes from, say, 0 to 1. There's a, a bit that flips somewhere internally. If that's the case, then this robot could learn to predict when it hits a wall under a certain policy. And this might be useful knowledge, even if it's not actually what we're trying to optimize. We might not be intending to hit the wall as much as possible, maybe quite, quite the converse. Or maybe it's just interesting for the agent to know when it, can hit, when it will hit the wall or not, irrespective of the rewards it gets for all of the other reasons. Okay, so if we have access to the values for all these signals and transformations of these signals, we could then try to learn to predict and control all of these signals. And to maybe say something uh, that follows quite naturally from what we said before, if we can fully control the reward signal and 
specifically if we can predict its uh, future values, future return, and then we can control this so we can also optimize it, then we've basically solved the problem that we set out to solve. Before you can actually do that, it might actually be quite useful to try to predict and control many other things as well. Now onto actions. So the goal is to select actions to maximize the value, which might have long-term consequences because the reward might be delayed. And this concretely might mean it might be better to sacrifice immediate reward to gain long-term reward. And essentially this is captured already immediately in the value function. If that's the case, then the value function for taking that action might be higher even if the immediate reward is lower. And examples of this include making financial investments, which might be, uh, if you look at the immediate reward, it might be a bad idea, but if you look at the long-term reward, it might be a good idea. For instance, or refueling a helicopter, which might prevent you from having to land or refuel later at a maybe much more awkward time. Um, or to block an opponent moves in, say, a board game, which might not immediately get you a lot of return or reward, but it might help your winning chances later on. In addition to state values, we can also uh, define action values, and that's sometimes going to be convenience. The definition here is very similar to the state value definition that I gave earlier. Let me go back there. It was up here which is basically just the return G, which is the cumulative discounted reward from a state S. And we denote that with V of S, value of S. And for action values, for historical reasons, we use Q. And these are sometimes called Q values. Um, that's the only reason, it's just a historical reason. There's no other reason why it's Q. And these are defined on the state action pair. And that means that we're simply just conditioning on the first action already being A, uh, the same A as on the left-hand side, whether or not our current policy would actually select that action. This allows you to do a very small, a small um, notion of counterfactual reasoning, if you want to, want to think of it like that. From a certain state, we could hypothetically, for each of the actions, in, in, uh, try to predict what the resulting value would be if you would take that action, and then follow policy pi, maybe your current policy, after that. And then if we have that for each of the actions, we can basically reason about each of these actions what the, what the value would be. And this is useful. This is related to the question about predicting the re reward, but instead of the reward, we're predicting the whole value. So the agent, so this is basically, this is all just definitions, right? So this is the definition of the value of taking an action A and then following a policy pi. We haven't yet talked about what the agent is actually doing, so we'll talk about that next. And the agent has a number of components, or potentially has a number of components, including the agent state and the policy. Both of those you'll basically always have to have, in a sense. And then optionally a value function uh, or a model, where the value function won't be the true value function, but necessarily, but it will be an approximation to that. The agent states is basically um, distinct from the environment state. And it's used basically as an input to the policy. So the policy of the agent is defined as a mapping from states to actions, where the state there is the agent's state. It cannot be anything else. That's the only thing the agent has access to. But also the environment has some internal states. In the simplest case, as I've discussed before, there's only one state, which means we don't have to even have to think about that. But that's already an interesting learning problem, because you might still want to reason about all the possible actions. Often there's, of course, many different states, sometimes infinitely many, especially if the states, say, lie in some continuous space, then there might be infinitely many states. As I said, the state of the, environment, of, of the agent generally differs from the state of the environment, and the agent might not have access to the full state of the environment. Even if the agent would have access to the full state of the environment, it might actually be too big to reason about meaningfully. So here we again see the, uh, the interaction of the agent and note that it actually only gets observations from the environment. So the environment state, the full state of the environment, might be observable, in which case the observation might cover all of that. But usually that's not the case. And even if it would be, it might contain loads of irrelevant information that even to process, even to look at for the agent might take simply too much computation for it to be uh, a meaningful thing to do. 
So typically the observations aren't the full environment state. And then it's sometimes meaningful to reason about the history of the agent. Starting at time zero, there's some first initial observation. And then the agent takes an action, A0. It observes a reward, R1, and a new observation, O1. And this then continues and continues. So you could think of this, for instance, as the sensory motor stream of a robot, where the observations are the inputs of the sensors coming into the robot from, say, a camera, maybe some, some auditory signals. And then the actions are the motor controls, basically the, the power it sends to its motors. And the rewards might be something that we define. Might be a function of the observations. That's often a simple way to define a good reward, where you, for instance, tell the robot, I want you to go to the bright place or something like that. And then it might get a reward whenever the brightness goes up in its camera. Um, the history then can be used to construct an agent state, which we will denote ST, and the future action will depend on this state. So, as I said, if the world is fully observable, we could think about the observation just being the full state of the environment. Then the agent can just use this observation, and this is, uh, the agent is then in what is called a mark of decision process. Markov decision process in general form a very useful mathematical framework and are used a lot within reinforcement learning. And the definition of that is that, it, that a decision process is Markov if conditioning on the full history, as we see on the right-hand side of that equation, will give you the same probability of a reward, potentially discount, and a next state as if you'd only conditioned on the current state. What does this mean? It basically means that the future is independent of the past, given the present, where the present is your current state. Phrased differently, it means that the, the state contains everything that you need to know for the future. Doesn't mean it contains, it doesn't mean it, 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 it is the full history, it just means it's sufficient, in a sense. So once this state is known, the history might then be thrown away without incurring any uh, disadvantages. The full environment state, I would posit, is typically Markov, although it might be extremely large. And the history itself is Markov as a state. If you would just replace ST on the left-hand side with HT, the history, then obviously this is true. It's not particularly useful, though, if your history becomes too, wild, too, too large uh, and unwieldy to manage. More commonly, we're in a partial observable setting, where the agent gets some partial information about the state of the environment. As I mentioned, you could think of a robot with a camera vision, and for instance then, the robot might not be told its absolute location, even if knowing that location would be very useful for its policy. Another example would be a poker player agent that only observes the public, public cards, but doesn't know the cards of the opponents. In that case, this is not a, a fully observable setting, and... Uh, the observation now is not Markovian. Formally, this is called a partially observable Markov decision process. It's quite an obvious name in that sense. And note that the environment state might still be Markov, although the agent cannot access it. And indeed, it typically is, because typically when you say, for instance, if you think about, say, running a simulator or something, there's something in the simulator that is used to compute the next step of the environment, and that will be the sufficient state so that might be the Markov state of the environment, which might not be visible to the agent. Yes? Uh, you used to say you use a PUM BP. Don't you mean that the environment state is definitely Markov? <coughs> yes. So um, in a PUM DP, is the environment state Markov? I would actually posit that the environment state is always Markov in basically any problem of interest. You can define things in such a way that that's not true, but I'm not sure that's a particularly useful <laughs> definition. But do you, do you still get a POMDP then? Is it then still a POMDP, I would say? Well, depends how you define a POMDP exactly. Um, in practice, it doesn't really matter. So in practice, we can just think of the environment state as being Markov, but we just don't see everything. And then it would be a POMDP. <coughs> Indeed, typically in a POMDP, there's some definition on... Uh, uh, your observations being uh, a function of the state, which is Markov. So there must be then some underlying Markov state, and your observation is just some function of that. So the agent state now can only ever be a function of the history, 
And the agent's actions can only ever depend on its state. That's the definition of the state. It is what is in the agent right now. So its actions must depend on that and only that. So an example would be that the state is your observation. This would be one choice, but it might not be the best choice. And more generally, it might be some function of, I put there uh, the previous state, action, and the current observation, where f there is what's sometimes called the state update function. Um, you could also toss the reward in there or whatever else uh, is there in terms of signals. I didn't put the reward there because you could also think of the reward as being part of the observation or, as I said, being internal to the agent. These, this agent state is typically much, much smaller than the environment state for, for instance, computational reasons. You have some limited compute that you can do and therefore you don't want this to grow indefinitely. Right, so um, just losing the Markov property, if I, if I paraphrase correctly, otherwise correct, just losing the Markov property does not actually mean that you have to depend on the history. Um, for instance, as I said up there, you could still define the agent state as being the current observation. The only thing to then be aware of is that this observation might not have all the information that you need to make an optimal decision. And then in general, what we say, well, more generally, we could, could, we could define our agent state as being some function of the previous agent state and the action and the observation, or even more, more generally, some function of the history. <laughs> and basically what I'm saying is that this is, this is maybe useful in some cases. Instead of relying only on the current observation, it might be useful to have some uh, ongoing state within the agent that you continually update, but it is also allowed to, for instance, remember things from the past because this can be useful for the decision process. Um, the problem would still be a POMDP. So in terms of the interface, what, what, what problem is the agent trying to solve? This is a partially observable Markov decision process. Um, and the, the, only on the agent side are we talking about maybe remembering something, building up an agent state is maybe a useful algorithmic tool in order to perform better. Did that? So to give an example, this might be a very simple problem where there's some maze and your full environment state might be the maze, maybe in addition where you are in that maze, um, because typically you don't just have a maze, you have an agent in the maze. I didn't depict the agent here. Um, and this might be a potential observation. Let's say the agent is in the center of this three by three uh, little field and it can only see the immediate points around, then it might observe this. And for instance, this could just be some numbers that the agent then consume, consumes. Maybe the walls are, uh, are encoded as ones and maybe the empty passage is encoded as zeros. Sorry, the black is supposed to be a wall and then white is supposed to be uh, empty. Uh, and then it's, this would just be nine numbers that the agent or nine bits that the agent gets as input and then it can hopefully try to do something with that observation. We could see an observation in a completely different location but note that in this specific example, both of those observations are actually indistinguishable. They're the same observation, even though you're in a different position. Now, depending on the reward function, you might want to be able to distinguish between those, those two in order to even decide which way you want to go. So here's a question. How could you construct a Markov agent state that does tell you all that you possibly uh, would want to know in order to predict the future in this maze? for any reward signal. So if you, don't have, if you don't commit to any reward signal, you should still be able to build up a mark of agent state. Does anybody have a suggestion? Yeah? Yeah, so the suggestion is to uh, basically keep track of a small window of history, yeah. to, to have a, a couple of previous observations. Um, and indeed, in this case, this would be sufficient. For instance, if you would consider coming from the top, the previous observation would in both of these cases be, be different already. If you're coming from the bottom, one step wouldn't actually do it. But if you go two steps down, you would already again see something different. So if you have enough previous in, uh, observations in this case, you would be able to tell apart these two different states. And this would give you enough information to know exactly where you are. 
given that the maze doesn't change. So if you're, long, if you're in a maze long enough, at some point you'll learn where you are by just uh, being able to look at a couple of observations. So indeed, it's a good suggestion. Yes? Um, so if you keep track of your full history to decide what to do next, this would have the Markov property um, because you cannot add your history to your history and then do something more. Um, the only problem with that is that it's computationally too large, typically. Having a short history could be enough, but depends on the problem. I'm not sure that answers your question, though, so if you want to... Yes. Yeah. Right. So the question is, if I if I understood correctly, that if you um, so there's actually two questions. One is if you have a short history, uh, rather than just look at the current observation, does that then violate the Markov property? And the answer to that is it depends. A short history, like the problem there is the short bit. A short history might not be enough to still have all the information. Um, and more generally, in it, building up an agent state, even from your history, it might not lead to a fully Markovian agent state. It might lead to something that is maybe more Markovian. And in, in, in fact, a lot of people think about these things much more on a gray scale than black and white, either Markov or not. Um, but, so it might still be helpful to build up a short history, but it might not make it fully Markovian. And the second question is essentially, um, if I paraphrase and generalize it slightly, is can you build a, a good decision policy from a non-Markov state? And the answer to that is in practice, at least we found, yes, you can. So you don't need fully Markovian states in order to make the right decisions. Although you can set up examples, of course, where you're missing that key ingredient that you didn't know about. And then, of course, everything falls apart. Um, but in practice, it turns out that if you just have a little bit of memory, for instance, you have a couple of previous observations, or you have some learning system that learns some agent updates func function, that this already helps a lot. Thanks. Yes. Um, yes. So if the environment is fully observable, then um, actually this is a very interesting question. So if the environment is fully observable, that means that everything that you want to know is in that observation. And then the question is, then you never want to do anything else. You never want to like, build up more past observations or anything, because that would just be wasteful. And in one sense, this is obviously true, because if you, if you have to consume multiple, multiple observations, whereas just the last one already had all the information that you wanted to know, then this is true. However, the, the other thing that I said about the environment state is that it's often very big. So even if you couldn't observe the full environment state, you might still choose to only pay attention to part of it, to only basically do compute on part of it. And that part of it might still not be fully Markovian. So in practice, what sometimes is better is to, even if you do have access to the full environment state, to only use a very small part of it and then still build up some history or do some memory that allows you to build up a state that is still roughly Markovian, simply for computational reasons. So it's a good question. So it is indeed sufficient. Like if your current observation is sufficient, then that's enough. The, the, basically, the, 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 the distinction between these two methods is sometimes it's easier to build up the knowledge by looking at parts of the observation sequentially than it is to fully inspect the current observation. It's a good question. Um, why do I call it a Markovian state? So um, I've defined Markov earlier. You can define it in several ways. I mean, Markov itself, the property has a well-defined definition, but what we exactly mean here, um, I define it as such where based on your state and your action, you can predict the next state and the reward and the discount. Um, And here we're building up that state. So this, this, this is not actually reasoning about that in some sense. It's only, th that would be the next step would be to see if that state is Markovian. But this is the previous step in a sense in building up that state. So is F uh, 
itself going to be, uh, does it have a, have a certain property in terms of uh, Markov property? Well, typically, in many cases, f will actually be a deterministic function of your previous state and observation. The observation is random, of course, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't really matter too much for f. So f could be a fairly simple thing. Stacking a couple of observations, for instance, as was suggested before, is a deterministic function. You just keep your previous observation around. You, you, you have two observations, say. Each time you observe something new, you just toss away one and replace it with the new one. Um, it could sometimes be a stochastic function. Sometimes it's useful. But uh, in practice, it's often not. For instance, a common, common uh, if you happen to know about these things, uh, a common implementation these days is to implement this as a recurrent neural network. And a recurrent neural network has a very similar equation, which is basically saying, oh, I have some internal state, I see a new input, and then my new internal state will be some function of this input and the previous state. And that almost by definition is then a recurrent neural network, if you ask uh, people who work with these. The main <coughs> distinction being that typically for recurrent neural networks, and typically for neural networks in general, these are um, typically restricted to being differentiable functions. So they typically smooth functions of the inputs. Not necessarily the case, but typically they are, because this makes it easier for us to learn them. I'll say more about neural networks and deep learning uh, a little bit later. Uh, so this is sometimes also called memory instead of agent state. We like to call it agent state because it has the reinforcement learning viewpoint, but it's good to know that these are basically the same concept. Yes? Hmm. How do we know how much memory we need? So the, the sad answer to that is typically we don't. <laughs> so you just make a well-informed guess. Um, so what is helpful? So what is hard, what is easy? Sometimes it's very hard to pick a function, a state update function in advance for the problem that you're trying to solve without knowing enough about the problem that you're trying to solve. Or even if you do know quite a bit, it might still be hard to pick one. And this is why many people these days implement these things of recurrent neural networks because then we can optimize them. We can just learn from the data what a good update function is. There are still questions that are very related to the question that you just asked, which is how do we know how much memory we need? This is then related to the question of how do we know how to update this function and how to pick the specific architecture of this neural network that we're going to put in there. And again, the answer is typically, we don't really. So we just try a couple of things and we'll see what works. There is, of course, a lot of uh, knowledge now in the field of when, when things are sufficient. And of course, there's a certain notion of how big your agent state is. How many bits does it actually encode? And this will give you some upper bound on what it could potentially encode. So if you know something about how hard the problem is, and you know something about how much you want to remember, you might want to pick this to be at least a certain size in terms of capacity. But otherwise, it's a hard problem. Yeah? Will this neural network affect what the um, agent pays attention to in appropriate intervals? Will this network affect what the agent pays attention to? Yes. Typically, I, in, in at least one, one way of thinking about this, is that the state update function that is defined here is the only function that consumes the observation. And all the other parts of the agent, the model, the policy, the value function, all of the other parts, they just look at the agent state. So that means that this state update function is maybe the only part that looks at the actual raw observation. So then either you beforehand pick what it pays attention to, or it's some learning system itself, which then learns which part of the observation to pay attention to. Now, obviously, there's caveats here, because if at some point it stops paying attention to certain parts of the observation, then it might be very hard later to learn again that these are actually very important, because it's not paying attention to them anymore. But uh, those are just very hard problems in general, um, not specific to reinforcement learning. But it seems that we're at least scratching the surface a little bit, and that there are methods that can learn these things uh, in at least some, some domains quite successfully. <coughs> Yes? Uh, how can you be sure that the uh, state that you generated from the neural net is the accurate state? I mean, um, yeah. do you, can you come up with, a, with an error value or something, or, or a guarantee or something that, you know, this state is the current state of the entity? Because this is yes. So, sorry. Okay. So the question is, uh, can we be sure that if we're going to learn this, say, with a neural network, how can we be sure that this state is correct? And the short answer to that is we can't. And in fact, it might be a somewhat meaningless notion to, to talk about the correct state. 
Let's think about the example where the environment state is huge. It's a Markov state, but it's really large, much larger than fits in memory of the, of the agent, say. Then we can have no hope of reconstructing the actual environment state. We might still be able to find a state that is useful. We might even be able to find a state that is sufficient to, the, to find the optimal policy. But if you have enough storage and uh, computational capacity, yes. you, for example, the complete history, and then eventually you converge. Yes. But with a neural net, there is no guarantee. That's yes. my point. I mean, yes. If you want to connect, Indeed. If you want to compress data to a neural net, then yeah. things get a bit messy. So this is true. So the uh, um, the observation is that if you're going to learn this, uh, say with a, with a neural network, even if the true environment, uh, environment state does exist and your agent could potentially uh, map it, like could, could store it in memory and could reason about it, for instance the agent even has enough capacity to construct a full history, there's no guarantee that this recurrent neural network that we're training will find the solution which is sufficient, which has the properties that, that the optimal mapping is still preserved. And this is true. So this is, um, there's very little we can say these days, uh, and maybe in the future this will get better, but these days there's very little we can say with certainty about the solutions that these systems will find. And the reason for that is essentially that these systems are quite general. Typically these are nonlinear functions that we're trying to learn, and they can be applied to systems quite, quite broadly, but the flexibility means that they're very hard to analyze and we don't know a lot with certainty. So what we typically do know is that they typically get better over time and in some restricted cases we can say that much more firmly and we can say this will actually find say a local optimum in some sense. But can we guarantee in general that these will find the, the true state if that exists and is accessible uh, or learnable or even a useful state? Not really. We cannot really uh, uh, say that with certainty. Doesn't mean they don't work in practice though. So these are distinct things and they're both important and uh, it's also good to realize that, that we cannot always have these guarantees. Thanks. Okay. So that was about the agent state. So now we can move on to the policy which defines the agent behavior as I said a couple of times already and it's basically just a mapping from the agent state to an action. These, this can be a deterministic action, uh, sorry, deterministic policy, which means we have a deterministic mapping from uh, input states to an action, or it can be a stochastic policy, where basically we, we either denote that with p, sorry, pi a given s, or sometimes just pi s comma a, where we see both of those as inputs, and then the output is a probability. And this is very simply just the probability of selecting an action in the current agent state. So. Move, move on from that one quite quickly because we already covered the policy quite a bit. Now for the value function, this again is just the definition of the value, the true value under a certain policy, which is the expectation of the cumulative discounted return, it's just the sum of the rewards into the future with a discount factor, given your current state and given uh, your current policy. And it's good to know that this value depends on the policy. So actually you could also ask many different questions, predictive questions, for many different policies. You could say, hey, for this policy, what's my value? For that policy, what's my value? In many cases, we're actually quite interested in just knowing the value for the current policy. And this can then be used uh, to evaluate the desirability of different states, or it can be used to select between different actions. Yes? Um, why do you always use a discount factor? And does your theory change very much if you choose a discount factor? That's a good question. So why is there always a discount factor in my, uh, in my slides? And does the theory change if it's set to one? And the answer to that is, so the first answer is that the discount factor is somewhat more general. So if we can just include it, we can just say things more generally than if we would have to, uh, uh, if we wouldn't include it. Because you can indeed think of it as being one. And then indeed the good question is, so does anything change if it's equal to one? And yes, some things change. And there's also, um, sometimes you need separate theory for the, for the undiscounted case. Uh, in particular, you typically need a, an additional assumption for the undiscounted case, which is that the process will end at some point. Because otherwise your values could actually be infinite, and therefore it can be very hard to distinguish between certain policies because they both have infinite value, in which case the agent might just not care. Um, but typically when we do use undiscounted returns, we do this in problems that we call episodic which means at some point it ends, 
but you are allowed to restart and do it again. Uh, the Atari games, we saw a video of them earlier, are an example of this, where typically you play this until your game over, but then you start over again and you play it again and again and again. And another way to view this, I had these uh, time varying discounts on an earlier slide. Another way to view that is you could still uh, model this as a continuing problem, but then the discounts are maybe one a lot of the time, but sometimes they're zero. This is when you're game over. And when the discount is zero in that sense, this is basically when your prediction ends, and this means that our values, if this is always going to happen inevitably at some point, then at least the values are all well defined, even if the discount factor is one. The discount factor does interact with the algorithms as well, though, and it turns out it's actually easier to learn values for lower discounts, which is maybe intuitively obvious, but this can be very useful in practice. So in the Zitari games, for instance, we did use a discount factor which was lower than one. It was 0 0.99, which in these Zitari games basically means you have a look ahead of something like 10-ish seconds in the game, and beyond there, the rewards, you don't really care anymore. For these Atari games, that's sufficient. For other problems, you might need a much longer discount factor, much closer to one. Yeah? Do you have a factor of the discount factors over distribution? Could you have like a distribution over, like, could you have a, a, a different shape of the discount over time? And yeah, this is a very good question, and yes, you can. This is basically a geometrically decaying uh, function. Um, sometimes it's maybe more useful to have something that, that's low first, then goes up, and then goes down again. The reason we don't typically consider those as much is because we want this recursive relationship. We want to be able to say, we first observe the first reward, and then we can look at the value at the next state. And if you have a function that goes up and then down, typically these aren't as easy to reason about. However, turns out if you want something like that bump, um, you can get those if you look at the difference between the value with one discount and the value with a different discount. And these will have exactly that property. So you could just predict two different values for two different time scales. Sometimes the discount is referred to as the time scale of the problem. And then you can still therefore like pull out specific parts in the future that you care more about. These, by the way, seem to match quite nicely to what has been found in the human brain as terms, in terms of temporal uh, sensitivity, that these look a lot like the difference between different value functions, interestingly. Okay. So a value function inside the agent is going to be some approximation to this true value function. As I said, the return actually has a recursive form, which you can think of as the return is this cumulative discounted sum of rewards, which you can pull apart as just the first step where you see the first reward and then the rest of the return, maybe multiplied with a discount. And the value also has this recursive form, and this is going to be very useful, where we can say the value at a certain state is the expectation of the first reward, and then the discounted value at the next state. And this equation is known as the Bellman equation in literature these days, which was uh, uh, noted by Richard Bellman in the, in the 50s. And similar equations actually hold for the optimal value, which is typically denoted with a star in the reinforcement learning literature. So we replace this subscript of pi, the current policy, with a star, which basically stands in for the optimal policy. And this is quite interesting, because now we can reason about what the optimal value is that you could attain in this specific uh, mark of decision process. For simplicity, and a lot of the theory here is done in that setting, um, we typically think about the mark of decision uh, process case where you have full observability. So the state here might be uh, the full environment state and then all of this is basically, it's, it's not just optimal given your agent state in that sense, but it would be optimal for the actual problem then, if that is the case. And note that these optimal uh, values, these equations, do not depend on some arbitrary policy anymore. They don't depend on pi. They're self-contained definitions of the optimal values. And in reinforcement learning, we heavily exploit equations like this and we use them to create many algorithms. So the agents often approximate these value functions and there are many algorithms to plan or learn these efficiently. And the reason why we care about those is that with an accurate value function, we can behave optimally. This is, might be the most obvious from the, the action value function there. If we have the optimal action value function, we can just pick the action with the highest value in every state, and this will be guaranteed to be the optimal policy. 
for the problem. So in general, as I said, our problems might be too big to solve these things exactly, but with suitable approximations we can behave well even in intractably large domains. We might lose optimality, right? We might not be able to find the optimal value function or the optimal policy, but we might still be able to find better policies incrementally and repeatedly, and thereby do a lot better than we did initially. Okay, so I'll go through the final agent component and then I think we'll do a short break. Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, so in, in a fine and MDP, you, you have a well-defined uh, optimal policy. Um, and the question is, is, does something similar apply in continuous state MDPs? And I actually think that the continuous part doesn't really matter that much. That will be fine. Um, it's still well-defined. It might be <laughs> intractable to solve for, I, I think. But. So um, we have to be very careful when we talk about continuous uh, states. So we, we'd have an infinite state space, right? Um, and so I, 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 I agree with the, the comment that, that uh, the theory basically just goes through. But algorithmically, that might not be as interesting. Because the theory would maybe, it's well defined, like the optimal policy is well defined, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to find. So what people typically do then, they reason about what the solution is or the fixed point of a, of a certain method under some approximation. And then your solution, the, the, the quality of your solution will depend on the choices you make in your approximation. And you can actually reason about that as well, which means you can also think about like how close is that to the actual optimal thing and how does it depend on your approximation. And there's some, uh, some theory on that. Although you mentioned something about neural networks earlier, most of that theory is restricted to the linear case, if you have linear functions. Um, so if you have a Markov decision pro process, your optimal policy will be stationary and deterministic. If you're in a partial observable MDP, then... Yeah, okay. So I think the continuous state case doesn't change that it's, it's going to be stationary and deterministic policy. I think that still goes through, but I don't have a reference handy for you. <laughs> okay. So next... Uh, Potentially, an agent can have a model which predicts what the environment will do next. This can be useful for many cases. Of course, it's like an obvious thing that you could, could, could try to do. Um, when interacting with an environment and you're trying to learn things, you could try to learn the model. And what is a model then? Well, um, we have these two components that are important in some sense. It's the uh, next state prediction and the immediate reward prediction. Um, the problem with the model is it has certain benefits over value functions and policies in the sense that these are typically easier to learn because this is supervised learning now. You could just see which state you end up in or you could see which reward you end up receiving and then you could learn a, a, a function that basically takes the mapping from, from say, again for simplicity, let's think about the case where your states, your agent state is just your observation. Then these could just learn mappings from these observations to these next observations and mappings from the observation to the immediate reward that you get then. This is supervised learning, which is well understood and it uh, works really well in practice often. Um, the problem though is that the model itself doesn't immediately give us a good policy. We still need to plan then with this model. And this can be non-trivial. It can take a lot of compute to do so, depending on the model that you have. We could also consider learning the, the definition here for the reward says oh, our reward model will going to, is going to map to the expected reward from a state in action. Alternatively, you could learn to try to map the whole distribution or you could tr uh, learn a system that samples from this distribution. So basically then the goal of this model is to output rewards with the same distribution as the actual rewards that you're going to see. 
And this is especially useful for, for states because if you uh, output a, an actual sampled state according to the same distribution as you would have received in the real world, then you can plan through trajectories and you could have all of the branching that happens in the real world happen inside of the agent when it out, rolls out its model. Of course, then you'd probably want to re repeatedly roll out trajectories to, to, to be able to average over the noise. But this can be a useful approach. So what happens if a model makes mistakes? It's a very good question, because they always make mistakes. It's, uh, for non-trivial problems, you're not going to have an, a, a perfect model. Even if it's supervised learning, even if you're going to do pretty well, there will be some mistake, which basically will mean there will be some hole in the wall in your model, and the agent will think it's a door, and it will go there, and it'll bump into the wall, because the model, the model said there was a, an opening. And this will very, very often happen. Um, so essentially the solution to that is not to trust your model too much. And there's many ways to do that. There was recent work by some of my colleagues at DeepMind where they train the model and then they use this model to predict a couple of steps into the future. And then they just use the out output of that as inputs to a function that was trying to, to learn the values or the policy. So instead of trusting it completely, they basically said, here's some additional information that you might want to use that might be correct, and you might learn to trust it, or maybe it's a little bit shaky, but it might still be useful. Um, if you're going to literally plan with a learned model, it's, it happens very often that the resulting plan finds certain peculiarities of your approximation that aren't really there. And the reason is that most of our planning algorithms, they, they basically assume that the model is completely perfect. So they'll exploit anything that's in there. They don't have a notion of uncertainty about uh, how accurate the model is. This is a very active ongoing research, by the way, how to uh, work around inaccuracies of your model when planning. And there are some ideas, but there's no like, well-accepted general solutions to this yet. So it's a very good, good research question. So here's an example, a simple example, of course, for, uh, for exposition. Let's say we have a maze with a start and a goal, and the rewards are minus one on each time step. There's no discounting, but the minus one will already give the, uh, the agents, uh, it will spur it on to, to solve the, uh, the, the problem as quickly as possible. There's four actions, according to the cardinal directions, and the state is just where the agent is. If it's a fixed maze, just where the agent is, is Markovian, right? We don't need to see anything even. Just where you are gives you all the information that you possibly could need to have an optimal policy. Um, this is an example of an optimal policy, which you could try to learn directly. I didn't give you any learning algorithms on any of these things yet. I, uh, uh, you're going to have to trust me that there are methods that can learn this, but, uh, um, or can just plan through this if you have access to the whole thing. And this is then an act, uh, uh, a deterministic policy in this case, which steps through this whole uh, MDP. And this then is an example of the actual value function, the true value function. Um, so in this case, I put p, v pi there, but actually that's kind of a mistake where, or I should have just put v star there because this is actually the value for the optimal policy. You could also think about the value for the random policy, say, which would look different from this one. Note that the increments are with exact integers. This is because there's no discounting. So all of the rewards are equally uh, weighted e equally heavy, at which point we can just interpret these things as being the negative number of steps until you uh, exit the maze. And then this might be a model, which is wrong. So, so this is an example of a wrong model, because essentially what this model did, it basically learned an exactly correct reward function, but it's missing a transition there near the start, uh, going down. There's a whole part of the maze there, and the model basically thinks that the maze stops early. So this could happen. In this case, it doesn't hurt, because planning through this would still give you the optimal solution. Um, but of course, there's cases in which Maybe, maybe going down would have actually been a shortcut, in which case planning with the model would have, uh, with this wrong model would have given you the wrong solution. Okay. So, yeah, let me quickly go through this. Um, so just quickly categorize agents. This is just giving a little bit of terminology that I use, but also other people in the literature use. Value-based methods are agents that explicitly build an approximation to the value function by learning or planning, often by learning. Uh, policy-based agents, they build an explicit representation of the policy, so they build this function directly, 
but they typically don't have a value function. And in the value-based agents, they don't typically have a policy, if they're called value-based, because the policy is then just inferred from the values. Typically, value-based agents, they learn action value functions, these Q functions, and then you can build up a policy by just looking at, for each action, what is the value that I predict I'm going to get when I take that action. And then maybe you just take the action with the highest predicted value. Now, when we have both these components explicitly, a policy and a value function, then we call this an actor critic system. And then often the policy is learned by using the value function in some way. Now, a separate categorization, a separate dimension in which you can make a distinction is whether they have a model or not. Model-free agents, they have a policy and or a value function, but they don't have a model. Now, this is a bit contentious because some people call any neural network, say, a model, or any, any statistical model a model. Well, it's kind of in the name already. So you could call a value function a model, and this would be a very valid use of uh, basically statistical terminology. But in reinforcement learning, we reserve the term model more or less for things that predict the next state or the next reward. And we call a value function, if you just have a value function, we call that model-free, more or less for historical reasons. And then it kind of follows that a model-based agent, it could still optionally have a policy and or a value function explicitly, but in any case, it also has a model. And the model here is of the dynamics of the uh, system, of the transitions, of the reward. Which brings us to something that looks a little bit like this. So we have a Venn diagram with, uh, on the top left, we have the, the agents, agents that uh, store a value function. Top right, the agents that store a policy. And at the bottom, we have the agents that store a model. And these are then just terms that are used in the literature. Unfortunately, not completely consistently, but still fairly consistently enough to, to, to make it useful to be aware of them. Where we have value-based methods, policy-based methods, model-based methods. And then in the intersection of value and policy-based, we call these actor critics which could have a model, could not have a model. Um, there's no separate terms for agents that have a model and a policy or a model and a value. They're just called model-based value function learning agents or something like that. There's no specific term for that. Okay, and then I suggest we'll have a, a short break, 15 minute break, I don't know.